Welcome to Sunday Morning Devotional brought to you by Golden Isles Primitive Baptist Fellowship and Heart Floss TV. I'm V. Vernon Eckleberry, and this morning I have a lesson for you entitled The Gospel of the Stars. The Gospel of the Stars. And it's taken from the 19th Psalm, verses 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line, or their voice, is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Now, so obvious is nature's testimony of God that Paul writes in Romans, the first chapter, that humans are without excuse. Uh, those who deny God the Creator are without excuse because they're surrounded by all this evidence. Uh, the heavens and the firmament and the earth all speak to a creator. Now, Romans 2, verse 18 reads this way, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, they have the truth in their grasp but it does nothing. It means nothing. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. When they saw the evidence of God and God's handiwork everywhere, still, uh, they weren't thankful, uh, but they became vain in their imaginations, Paul writes. And then finally, they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature or the creation more than the creator. And we'll see how that works out in the lives of two people right now. Francis Crick, the British biophysicist, who with James Watson received the 1962 Nobel Prize for discovering the molecular structure of the DNA, the, the stuff of life itself. But I read a biography of Crick uh, this week, and I was stunned when I read Crick lost his faith by his early teens, turning instead to science to understand the world. Remember what Paul said, the mysteries that science had yet to explain, he later wrote, serve as an easy refuge for religious superstition. And then from the microscope to the telescope, we have the example of Carl Sagan, a renowned, uh, former uh, renowned astronomer. And uh, this is what he wrote in one of his books. I would love to believe that when I die, I will live again, that some thinking, feeling, remembering part of me will continue. But as much as I want to believe that, and despite the ancient and worldwide cultural traditions that assert an afterlife, I know of nothing to suggest that then it is more than wishful thinking. But then you contrast that 
with uh, Warren, Dr. Warren Weaver uh, as the director of the National Sciences Division of the Rockefeller Foundation. Warren Weaver coined the term molecular biology. He's, he's the father of, of that term. And his work in the scientific community uh, is renowned. And uh, in 1955, I remember reading this in our copy of Luke Ma uh, Look magazine, and it made an impression even in my early teens. He said in an interview, every new discovery of science is a further revelation of the order which God has built into his universe. So we have contrasting views here. We have two scientists with a view uh, uh, of space and a view uh, through the microscope that see no God in all of that. And then we have another famous scientist who sees God everywhere as the creator uh, and sustainer of all of the order that he observed in the universe. The Bible leads science in so many ways, uh, not uh, with the same theories and, uh, and the preciseness with which discoveries are made in our day, but yet it's there nonetheless. For instance, in verse 4 of our, uh, well, no, let's look at verse 6 of our reading in Psalm 19, speaking of the sun. The writer David says, His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Now, it wasn't until Isaac Newton came up with a theory that the sun sends out matter into space that science began to think about heat uh, coming from the sun, the sun as a source of heat. And here it was, uh, written into this psalm by the psalmist David. When I was teaching science at Claxton High School in Evans County, I had a memorable encounter. Uh, we were talking about uh, the uh, composition of the sun, and I made the statement that uh, the surface temperature of the sun is 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, I jokingly said, we won't have any astronauts landing on the surface of the sun. Well, uh, one young lady uh, raised her hand, who happened to be a friend of my daughter Dona, and she asked, uh, why is that? Why, why won't we land astronauts on the sun? And I said, because uh, the, the heat would destroy them. And she said, well... Why don't they land at night? <laughs> so our scripture this morning tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And that pretty well covers uh, the created universe, the, the, the whole of creation. And it cries out, it sings out, uh, because this is a, a song. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, in what ways do the heavens declare the glory of God? Well, first of all, creation declares the greatness of God. Listen to this from Psalm 147, verse 4. It reads that God telleth the number of the stars... He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord, and of great power his understanding is infinite. Now, the last estimate that we have is that uh, 
there are 10 to the 23rd power observable stars, and countless stars beyond that, of course. Now, that's a, a 10 with 23 zeros after it. But here we read of the greatness of God, and that is that he can tell the number of stars, and not only that, he calls them all by their names. Great is the Lord. And you know, the amazing thing is, when we read the story of creation, we find that the vastness of space, the stars, was seemingly almost an afterthought. In chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 16, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And of course, that's the sun and the moon. And then the last phrase, he made the stars also. You know, so uh, it was nothing for God because he is so great. He's the great creator. Creation declares the greatness of God. Secondly, creation declares the goodness of God. Over and over in the first chapter of Genesis, where we have the account of creation, we hear the phrase, it was good. It was good. And then it's all summarized in the 31st verse of chapter 1 of Genesis, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now that word good in the original Hebrew means pleasant, it means delightful, and it means beneficial, as when we say it is for your own good, or it's for your good. In fact, of Eve, we read in the third chapter of Genesis, verse 6, she looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and saw that the tree was good for food. In her eyes, it was good for something. Well, that's what creation is. God created it, and it's good. It's good for his creatures. It's good for that which he inhabits the earth with. It's good for you and for me. In First Chronicles 16.34, we read, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And what does that mean? The parallel phrase, for his loving kindness is everlasting. So we praise God because he is good. Creation cries that out, sings that, declares the goodness of God. Thirdly, creation declares the glory of God. Listen to this from Psalm 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Now that glory means to honor great quantity, multitude, wealth, reputation, majesty, splendor, all of this, you see, is built into the creation of the Creator. Creation declares the glory of God. Go out on any starry night, drive through the Smoky Mountains, stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon, look out over our vast seas, and one can only say, with the Queen of Sheba, when she beheld the glory of Solomon's kingdom, I came, mine eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. And so it is with creation declaring the glory of God. And we won't know half of that, uh, nearly half of that. Such is the glory of God revealed in creation. Now, fourthly, 
in addition to the greatness of God, the goodness of God, and the glory of God, creation declares the grace of God. Listen to this from Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4. David says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man or mankind that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man, that is, the humans within mankind, that thou visitest him. Carl Sagan looked at Voyager's two pictures that it took as it left our solar system that showed our planet as but a little blue dot. And he wrote of that, Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity and all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. Well, here's the deal, Dr. Sagan. God who created that lonely little pale blue dot loves it enough not only to come and save us from ourselves, but he purchased it for an unfathomable price. Listen to this, John 3, 16. You're familiar with this. For God so loved the world, this world, this little cosmic speck. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world or, or destroy it, but that the world through him might be saved. Yes, help did come from elsewhere, and uh, it showed us the ultimate purpose for creation. And it is articulated by Paul in Ephesians 2.7 that in the ages to come, he might, that is God, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Scan the earth and the skies from the tiny strand of DNA that Crick looked at to the outermost reaches of the universe that Carl Sagan studied and know that grace through Christ our Lord is the purpose of it all. That's what the creation declares to true believers. The greatness of the Creator, the goodness of the Creator, the glory of the Creator, and the grace of our Creator. Now may God be with you till we meet again.